most of our customers are researchers, so both in academia as well as industry. And naturally, uh, there are a lot of users that are engineers and um, researchers that spend a lot of their day in MATLAB, and they're very familiar with the environment. So we wanted to um, really leverage on that and uh, build essentially the, the best MATLAB API that we could possibly build. Some of the requirements that we had, um, both internal and external, was we wanted to work directly with MATLAB scripts. So at the end of the day, a lot of robotics problems come down to matrix multiplications, and the MATLAB language is just fantastic for that. We wanted to have no overhead, and by that we mean no overhead in the workflow. So um, th no code compilation or targets or starting other processes before. I think it should really just be scripts, um, run them, and that's it. We wanted to run on default hardened software, um, so no special kernels, no special uh, networking cards, really just equipment that the users already have. And we wanted to run on any operating system. And we tried to find data on what that means, or you know, like standard Windows is not a real-time operating system, so it's typically not, not used for this. Um, and there's not a lot of data out there on what you can actually expect. So we did take about on the order of half a billion measurements, um, and the maximum that we saw was about three to like 17 milliseconds for these, these um, like non-real-time OSs. So when we talk about real-time control, it usually means different things to different people. So on one level, we have hardware drivers. And here we're talking about microseconds, uh, jitter in, uh, in general, like um, motor control, um, encoder drivers, things that really have to run like in, in hard real-time. And these have to run in firmware. Like, there's no way that we can actually get these to run on Windows. However, um, what's nice about this is this is rarely where the innovation happens, right? Like, this is, these are device drivers. The hardware manufacturers should just provide drivers that work, and users shouldn't really have to write their own encoder drivers, for example. Then on the level above that, we're talking about system behavior. So if you have a robot, what do you actually do with it? Um, how do you build trajectories, or how do you coordinate your five robots that are all across the room. And here, um, th we are talking about millisecond deadlines. So this is actually something we can run on, on like user-level computers. And for a wide variety of systems, we found that occasional jitters up to like 50 milliseconds or, or even higher, depending on the system, um, are generally not a problem. So here's a robot uh, that we built for a robotics conference last year. It's balancing on two wheels. Um, it's running various impedance controllers plus the balancing and everything. Um, and the entire uh, robot is running a, in a single MATLAB script that has about 500 lines of code. It's essentially a big, big while true loop. Um, and it can run I indefinitely without falling over. So when we, <laughs> yeah, the kids love the fun with that. That was after the conference when we thought, um, you know, it doesn't matter anymore if anything breaks. <laughs> um, okay, so we tried a lot of different things when we when we created the API, from like message-driven systems to um, various things. What we what we eventually ended up with, and this is of course a bit of a simplified view, um, is a system works as follows. So each one of these boxes is a, is a background thread. and you can do this using some of the external interfaces that MATLAB provides. So either Java or Max. Um, in our case, we used a Java API. Um, on the very left, you see a, um, a requesting thread. So that gives you a um, sort of best effort to um, get the data rates that you're setting. So for example, if you set a, a kilohertz, um, on real-time Linux, it would actually give you kilohertz. On Windows, you would get on the order of like 640 ticks, roughly. Um, that sends UDP messages out to, to an actuator, uh, which runs all the like, low-level device drivers. On, and then that responds with, an, with another message that gets um, received by a dedicated thread. Um, so that gets received, decoded, and if you have more than one actuator, it gets synchronized in there as well. And then it gets um, queued up for MATLAB to essentially pick it up. Um, and then MATLAB, when, it, when it's running the, the main loop, um, you can uh, basically call a get next feedback, which either is a blocking call if there's nothing available, or it will just return immediately if there's already feedback there. Um, and in MATLAB, you can basically you said, focus very much on the behavior itself. So everything that's not the, the main behavior of the robot is, is actually running either on the um, distributed devices or in, in a different language. 
which makes it quite efficient. So here's an API example. Um, so we have our behavior loop in the beginning. We can read the sensors, and this would be a struct um, with a vector of all the different actuators that are within a group. And a group can, for example, be a, a robot. It doesn't really matter how many degrees of freedom. I think it can also be a single device. Um, then we have the, the, the behavior itself, like the math part. Um, in this case, we are just doing a virtual spring, which depending on how far away, you're away how far uh, you are from the zero position, um, it tries to push back further. Um, it's all in SI units. And uh, in the previous example, so this would be instead of one line behavior, you would have your 500 lines. But it can be arbitrarily complicated. Uh, and then we just update the set targets. Um, and that, again, is a, is a Java call out. And for users, they don't need to know anything about threading. And uh, it, it all really just looks like MATLAB code. And they don't need to know what's underneath. Another thing that was very important for us uh, was data logging. So MATLAB, um, at least in the current versions, doesn't really have a great way to, do, um, to log long or large amounts of data. So um, by that I mean you, you always have to either pre-allocate uh, a cell array, for example, or you have to have something that's continuously expanding, uh, which gets inefficient very quickly. So what we do instead is we take the um, uh, receiving thread from before, and we can actually um, write the raw data to disk, and in MATLAB you can define, okay, here, here's, here's where I want to start my data, and here's where I want to stop. And um, then once you stop it, you can replay all of the log data back into the system and actually convert it into, into a format that MATLAB can read, so like a MAT file or CSV or, or just an in-memory struct. So the code for this looks like this. Um, I grayed out the, the non-important parts for this. Um, so it's just start log and stop log, and then what stop log um, returns is essentially the same struct as before, but now instead of vectors, we have matrices of everything, uh, which then interfaces really well with the MATLAB plotting libraries. And so the, the last call there would give us a plot of all the positions of all the actuators of our, over the entire um, period of logging time, which, yeah, that, that has worked out quite well. Like the, yeah, we, we, are, we are big fans of the, um, doing analysis and, and like MATLAB plotting libraries. So um, for the results, we were actually a bit surprised by how well we were able to get it to run. Um, so if we, we did try it on real-time Linux um, with some uh, you know, additional tuning, like if you're interested in the details, we can talk more later. But we got it, the worst case jitter down to uh, sub 200 microseconds, which is actually good enough to run some of those um, more demanding applications directly uh, from MATLAB. We were able to uh, reduce the learning curve quite a lot. So we have freshman students that come in, and within a few hours, they get up and running, and they have they are writing their own code. And all this ends up in extremely fast prototyping because, you know, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a very iterative process. And right? so you are changing something, you figure out whether it works, then you change it again, and um, there there are no additional steps. It's really it's just uh, you just rerun the section and you try if it works. So we do have um, more details available online. Um, here, here are some links. And we do also have a lot of open source projects that kind of um, help with, with the real-time control problem, including things like keyboard inputs and, and sort of supplementary libraries. Thank you.